I find that completely implausible. If somebody said to me, hey, what's more likely, if I didn't know any better, and somebody said to me, what's more likely to produce consciousness, a, a random search or some very smart scientists who will, who by the way, can also use random search if they want to, but they can also have, you know, a rational design. I would say, well, of course, the second one. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Produced by Soapbox Media. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this episode, I continue my exploration into the nature of consciousness and awareness. I have learned a lot in my exploration to date. I've investigated even Hindu and Buddhist ideas on awareness, and I've delved into the underlying quantum mechanical nature of reality. I've discussed ideas of quantum computing and biological links to the mysteries of quantum mechanics. My guest today is an expert on the cellular basis of memory and cognition. If you like what you're hearing, please press like on your podcast app, share it with your friends. Michael Levin received dual BS degrees in computer science and biology, followed by a PhD from Harvard. After postdoc training at Harvard Medical School, he started his independent lab at Forsyth Institute, focusing on the biophysics of cell-cell communication during embryogenesis, regeneration, and cancer. In 2009, he moved his group to Tufts, where they use biophysical and computational approaches to study decision-making and basal cognition in cells, tissues, and synthetic living machines. Levin holds the Vannevar Bush chair and directs the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts, working to crack the morphogenic code for applications in regenerative medicine, bioengineering, and artificial intelligence. Recent work includes the modulation of native bioelectric circuits to control embryogenesis, regeneration, and cancer, and the creation of novel synthetic living proto-organisms. Dr. Levin, welcome to The Rational View. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. Could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be a, an expert in, in these fields and a, a dual Bachelor of Science degree? That, that's very interesting. Sure. Um, and, and, and I should say, I, I don't know how much uh, any of us are actually experts in what I think is really a, uh, an emerging uh, field. I think we're just scratching at the beginnings of it right now. But my my own background is um, I was uh, from from the earliest uh, times that I can remember. I was interested in uh, both life and technology, and interested in the difference between uh, you know sort of obvious machines that we use versus the living organism insects uh, that I used to uh, you know watch as a kid and and so on. And uh, originally, I was going to uh, I was going to be uh, do computer science. I was interested in com in computer science, artificial. Um, artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, this that that seemed like a good uh, a good entryway into understanding mind and how it can be embodied in the physical world is to try to create some during you know with with uh, com com uh, computational tools. And then uh, while I was in and so I did some some uh, some programming for for work and things like that. And then I went to, I went to undergrad. I got a degree in in computer science and. To, you know, uh, right around that time, I kind of realized that I think biology is going to be a really critical part of this, and in particular, developmental mm -hmm. biology. And we can talk about why that is. And so I and so I got I got two two degrees one one in computer science and one in biology. And after that, uh, sort of dropped uh, all the software stuff I was doing, and and basically just went to graduate school in genetics. I see. Yeah. No. That that sounds very interesting, and. This I've had a lot of parallel interest in, in artificial intelligence and minds, and that's why I'm doing this particular series of, of podcasts. So why is it that you felt biology is key to this problem? Well, perhaps um, the one of the most wondrous aspects of, uh, of science is that we all make the journey from just a uh, what what people often refer to as just physics, you know, a, 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 a collection of quiescent chemical networks sitting in an unfertilized egg, and then eventually that becomes a at, at least in the case of humans, it becomes a uh, an advanced uh, cognitive system able to have second order metacognition and uh, you know make claims about being not just a machine and, and and all kinds of fun things like that. But but that that journey right from being a, a quiescent oocyte. Which many people would look at and say, "Okay, this thing is not cognitive in any way. It's just chemistry." 
but somehow it becomes whatever it is that we are. And that's a very slow and gradual process. There's no magical line at which is, you know, some sort of lightning bolt uh, bestows uh, true cognition on us. It's a, it's a slow, it's a slow transformation. And that to me is, if anything is magic, that's magic there, because basically what you see is, is physics becoming mind. It's that, that happens every single time some some sort of egg becomes an organism or or a human or, or or not human and so so i think developmental biology in many ways holds the answer to some of the deepest problems of of, of science and philosophy personal identity all of those things hmm. yeah it, it's it's a it's a complex field and i think a lot of us uh, are hesitant to enter biology because it's so so complex and physics has a lot of simple simplicity to it in a controllable experiment where your subjects don't adapt and evolve and change and yeah. uh so so con congrats to you for for taking that leap and, and and taking on the challenge of of biology in this um so uh you your research program is very broad you your bio says you're researching decision making and basal cognition in cells can you can you tell me what that means? Yeah, um, <clears throat> our <clears throat> our lab um, looks like it does a million different things, but actually everything that we do is all connected to one fundamental question, and it, that that question plays out in aspects of machine learning and in regenerative biology and in cancer and in evolution and the behavior science and so on. It's the same question. The question is, how do complex emergent minds? arise out of combinations of uh, smaller modules that are also competent in some way. So, so we are all, you know, all, all intelligences are collective intelligences, right? We're all made of parts. Every, every intelligence is made of parts. And some, some of those parts are themselves very competent and, and so on and down the line. And so the question is, how does the scale up work? How is it? What, what kind of relationship between cells gives you a big, a, a, a large mind? What kind of uh, chemical uh, events give you cells and so on? So at every level, you can ask this question about scaling up. I think it's really interesting. And so in our group, we, we tackle that in uh, a variety of contexts. But the most the one where we've made the most progress is at the level of cells. So we study how individual cells become problem solving individuals and have some degree of basal cognition in various spaces. This is not just the traditional uh, three-dimensional space of, of behavior, which is what, what most people study for intelligence, but also other spaces. So, so physiological state space, transcriptional space of gene expression, and in particular, morphous space, the space of all um, geometric configurations of the body. So cells, figuring out how cells navigate all those spaces is kind of an invariant that ties all of our work together. Mm -hmm. now, I've spoken with um, uh, Dr. Arthur Reber, who's a, a psychologist mm. uh, or philosopher who who looks at um, who who ans who's trying to answer the question as well as how where does consciousness arise? And his his position is that in individual cells are sentient or aware to some extent. And is that what what do you mean by basal cognition? Is that the same sort of thing that there's some basic awareness in a cell that it has a, a first person experience? Well, these are all related terms, but I think we have to be very careful if we're going to make progress here. So I generally do not talk about consciousness almost at all. I mean, we can we can get into it if you want. I have a few things to say, but but the, the vast majority of my work specifically avoids that issue. So so basal cognition and as as I define as as I define sentience, which is <clears throat> the ability of of uh, being aware of events that are ongoing and reacting adaptively, that doesn't necessarily say anything about consciousness, right? So that's something that, to, to a to a small degree, could be attributed to a thermostat, a, a you know a, a Roomba navigating your room. There, are, there are many things that have uh, is, is, that have the ability to sense their environment and behave appropriately. The existence of a first person perspective is a whole other sort of kettle of fish that we can that we can get into. But but basal cognition, the the field of basal cognition is very by itself is very third person science. It, it has to do with behavior. It has to do with prediction of behavior. It has to do with computation, and it has to do with us as third person observers and scientists trying to come up with models for the kinds of things we see these creatures doing. And of course, the creatures themselves 
having some sort of model of what they themselves are doing, right? So, so to some level of sophistication, there may be self-modeling going on and so on. None of, none of this specifically involves having to make any claim about consciousness at all. I think, I think you can make great progress in basal cognition and, and do very well and make, learn lots of new things without ever touching the issue of consciousness. So, so I just want to, I just want to make that clear when I, when I'm making claims about cognition, it isn't specifically about cautious, consciousness at all. I see. Okay, that, that's good because def definitions are seem to be few and far between in this field. So it's yeah. <laughs> very important. I think a lot of the un misunderstanding is that people have different definitions when they're talking about yes. the same words. That's exactly right. People, I, I've, I've found, yeah, I found that not only do people have different definitions, people have very different rules as far as what counts as uh, evidence for and against certain claims. And so you will often find, you, you will often find um, two people arguing where, one person is trying to argue about specific experimental outcomes and someone else is, and, and the other person is actually arguing about very large scale kinds of interpretation and, and, and philosophical approaches to things. So, so, so to me, all agency claims are engineering claims. When you tell me, and we can, we can dive into this, but, but when you tell me that something has a certain level of agency, what you're actually telling me is how I go about interfacing with that system whether it be in, a, in an engineering context or in a relationship or whatever it is, there are claims about how we are going to be able to interact either in a very advanced way or a very simple way, but there are you know, certain ways. So, so that's, that, that's a very empirical approach in which all of those claims are, are eminently testable. So if we make a specific um, claim about the agency of some, some system, I interpret that as an engineering protocol. I will then attempt to, to, to interface with that system using that protocol, and we will find out that we were either right or wrong. So if you tell me that a certain system has the cognition to have a particular kind of goal-seeking behavior with memory and whatever, well, we can try it and find out if that actually helps us understand the system. Other people, so, so that's where I'm coming from. I, I take all of these things as not, not philosophical um, conjectures. These are all empirical claims that are to be tested. Other people, you know, other people may have fundamental... Um, uh, commitments to things. And the question then becomes, and it's very hard to argue when these things don't match up. It's hard for two people to have a productive conversation because other people might have specific commitments to certain outcomes. And any theory that uh, lands outside of those outcomes is automatically wrong because the commitments take precedence. So it's a question of, you know, some people will say, I, I don't want to hear any theory in which thermostats have, uh, have goals because I do not believe that thermostats can have goals, period. So if you tell me, so, so any theory that has that as a, as a, as a consequence, I'm, I'm calling it automatically wrong, right? So, so the question is, uh, whereas, whereas to me, that, that's very much an empirical question. We're going to find out if, if that's a useful way to, to think about things, right? And I think that was settled by cybernetics, you know, 60 years ago, but that's a different story. So, so the point is, yeah, people, people often argue, um, and, and, I think, and I think they need to set right up front what's going to be the the deciding uh you know process for these kinds of things hmm. and that's very um you know very rational uh, coming from the rational view I, I like the empirical focus and the you know very science based uh, approach to this uh and you know the philosophical um analysis of this can come later once you have the the empirical basis settled and i think that's that's how we make pro progress in science is, is testing our ideas and you know you start from the the high level theory and you go down and say okay here's a an experiment that will differentiate and you make the experiment and you you come out with a result that that ref helps to, to refine the higher level theory so just just to be very clear you know you say that cells make decisions i mean what is but you're not talking about uh, awareness or conscious thought it, it's responding to stimuli and and uh, goal seeking behavior when you're talking about decision making or, or can you maybe clarify a little bit so that we're not confused sure sure and and to and to be very clear um i don't believe in binary categories about almost anything and so when we talk about you know does it really make decisions i would replace that with the question of how much is some event uh, profitably viewed as a, a decision versus as something else? And so I see everything as a spectrum or a continuum, and then we can sort of discuss where certain events are on this, on this continuum. I think that uh, it's important to remember that the vast majority of decisions that you make and I make are, uh, have no awareness to them. 
So the, the, the vast bulk of our, of our behavior and cognitive performance is not the kind of thing where I sit down and I say, all right, now I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to go to, you know, I'm going to go to, to, you know, to grad school or I'm going to uh, quit and, uh, you know, uh, do something else. Th those kind of conscious decisions are the, the, the icing on the, on the, on top of the cake that is, is our cognition. So, so let's just, you know, sort of know that right from the front that, that, that even in humans, uh, conscious decision-making is a, is a, is a huge minority of what, of what we do now. Having, having said that, yes, when I say decision, I do not mean that, you know, sort of very rare in the biosphere uh, event where it's second order, meaning I know that I'm about to make a decision. I am, I have metacognition that, that is aware of the process of decision making. I'm not talking about that at all. Uh, a simple decision, the, 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 the degree to which something is a decision, I would propose, here's a definition I will propose and you can, you know, you can sort of react to see if you, if you like it. My, my definition is this, uh, some event it, 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 one, one more piece of uh, piece of background that we need to get into this. Um, sometimes people will will frame it like this. They will say, "Was that a decision, or was that just the physical process?" I mean, uh, you know, I, I can track the, the the what just happened, and it looks just like a piece of physics to me. So, so the thing is that if you zoom in far enough, of course, everything is a physical process. There's nothing you're going to write you're going to have, whether in humans or anywhere else where if you dig in far enough, you're not going to see just physics. So, so I think this is very much not a, is decision something magical that doesn't have physics underneath? Of course it does. The question is, what else does uh, the concept of decision-making give you beyond, well, I'm going to track the electrons and see where this thing sort of ends up. And so, so, so here's, here's, here's my, uh, my take on the decision-making. The degree to which something is a decision uh, rests on to what extent is the best model for what just happened it needing to involve things at a bigger radius in space and time? So if I can explain everything that you just did uh, very efficiently with local causes, that's not much of a decision. That's a that's a that's a that's much more closer to the physical, you know, sort of set of pushes. So if you're a if you're a if you're a billiard ball and I come over and I and I sort of push you in a particular way and you go and then somebody looks at that and says, okay, how do we explain what just happened? You don't need to know much of anything that happened before the push in order to say what happened. That's not much of a decision. On the other hand, if you're going to have a a complex organism that just did something and the and the and the best explanation and then we can get into what's a good explanation the best explanation for what happened talks about well you know two weeks ago it had this experience and uh that made a huge impact into in in what it just did and by the way it's also taking in evidence from something that's happening in the next room or maybe it's receiving signals from you know once once you once you have a process that starts integrating across a, a, a larger uh, a light cone, so to speak, right? To, to borrow some some physics uh, terminology, uh, the more the more the more stuff needs to go in to explain how that process happened, the more likely it is that it's a decision and not just a piece of physics. That's that's kind of a first order, um, you know. That's a, that's a, that's a first order explanation. So so you can start to look at so so here are some some um, kind of in between cases. So. So you have a uh, you have a slime mold, and the slime mold is sitting in the middle of a in the middle of a dish, and it uh, what you've done is and we've and we've we've recently published exactly this this work. You place um, one glass disc off about ten centimeters to the left. You place another uh, a, a, a three glass discs off to the right, and the and the physarm the slime mold is sitting in the middle. The whole thing is one cell. Physarm is just one cell, so it's sitting in the middle. You've got one glass disc to the left, one, three glass discs to the right. These discs are completely inert. They have no food or anything else on them. They're just glass. And what you will find out is that for the first few hours, that slime mold sort of grows in an equal radius. It just sort of expands right in the middle. It's not going in any direction. It just kind of grows. But after a few hours, it goes boom, and it grows right to where the three discs are. So what's happening is that during the time that it's, it's sort of sitting there, the first few hours, it's put, it's um, uh, uh, tugging on the substrate because it sits on this gelatin and it tugs on this on this agar. And by feeling the vibrations that come back, it's it's almost like a kind of sonar. It can basically it can basically sense where the mass distributions are in its environment because the strain angle of these um, uh, of these of these weights pushing down on the on the agar. It can, it, and the and the and the sensitivity is in this thing is incredible. These glass discs are milligrams in weight. I mean, the sensitivity of this thing is insane. But what it does after a while is is it reliably goes towards the three. 
Okay, it, it prefers going towards the heavier masses. I, I don't know why I assume because in the wild, if, if there's a big mass nearby, something must have keeled over and died and could go, go over and eat it. I, I'm guessing that's what it is. So, so there are two, you know, there are two levels, right? One level is just the physical facts. Do, do, we, do we agree that that's what the Physarum is doing? And anybody can do this experiment and see that, yes, in fact, that's what happens. And then the next, the next thing is, okay, is that a decision? So now you can do the same thing with it that you might do with a with a human or or a bowling ball or anything else. You zoom in, and at the micro level of detail, all you're ever going to see is physics. And so the way it works, of course, inevitably, what else could possibly be under there? Of course, it's going to be physics. But but psychologically, it, it's um there's a there's a there's a phenomenon which which really um kind of upsets me every time I encounter it, and I see it a lot. Here's what happens: if I give a talk and I talk about this Fizarum doing this. People are amazed. They said, "My God, this thing is uh, you know this this thing is able to make a make a make a choice to go here or there, and and then you know basal cognition. Everybody's very excited. Then then we show the physical mechanism. We show how it happens. Well, here's how it happens. It, it has a there's a certain um, cytoskeletal set of events, and they set vibrations in the in the thing, and the the strain the strain comes back through the through the agar, and then there's a stretch stretch activated calcium channel, and that gets opened up in a particular way. The calcium pulses uh, um, uh, kind of trigger more growth on one side. So you once people see the explanation, then they go, oh, well, 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 I see how that works. That's well, well, that's just physics. That's not, you know, that's not so cool. And and you know, and that and, and, and that kind of drives me drives me crazy all the time because I feel like, well, first of all, having explanations to things should make should 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 make you happier, not not disappointed. That's that's first. And second, a, a, it, it doesn't change the nature of what happened. Of course, there's some physical story to be told. Of course, there is. Uh, and in fact, it, and it's and it's super cool. I mean, there's more. There's memory involved here because during those first few hours that it's doing this, it isn't actually going anywhere. It's sitting con completely still until it forms some sort of um, uh, some some sort of biophysical representation of which way the mass is going, and then and then it takes off, right? So so there's all kinds of cool events, but but of course there's physics underneath. So now you can start to ask, you know, was that a decision? And if you and if you focus on the physics, you might be tempted to say, well, now that I know how it works, I don't think that's a decision. I think that's the only way it could have happened. Right. If you're in some, some sort of micro determinist. But that, of course, is a story you could tell about everything. In that case, there are no decisions. So if we're more if we're more on the biological side of things where decisions are, are a useful concept, then it's very clear that this is a kind of decision. Does it take into account what happened two weeks ago? No, it does not. Does it take into account? What's going to happen in the future? Apparently not, but it does take into account what's happening over a 12, you know, let's say a 10 or 12 hour time period on the scale of, let's say, 10 or 15 centimeters. That's a degree of decision making that, frankly, of the size you would expect of a slime mold, right? It is, you know, it isn't uh, the kind of thing you would expect from a human nor what you would expect from a bowling ball. It's basically what you would expect from a slime mold. So that's so that's my, my take on decision making. You, it, it, it occurs to some level of scale and we do experiments and then we see how much decision making there is. Yeah, it, does, it seems it's the black and white uh, responses is hard to defend when you start getting to that level of detail. Uh, everything should be on a spectrum in that case. And and yeah, it depends on which direction you come at it, how you see it. That, that's that's a good observation. So, moving on, uh, so many interesting questions that I'd like to explore with you. Uh, <laughs> how how do collections of individual cells become a unified self? This is something that's come up previously in in people claiming that you know the basis of of awareness is individual cells, but they had no idea about. They had said something about synchronized synchronization but it's it's a kind of hand wavy right you you're right in the in the dirt here what what's going on okay uh so so i'll i'll tell you a story that i think is reasonable uh with with two caveats one is that of course this is uh, this is we, we don't know yet that this is going to be the best story so this is just something that that i've come up with and and we'll see we'll see over the years we'll see how it fares and uh and b this is not a story about about consciousness okay this is a story about cognition so, so the story I'm going to tell is this: um, Imagine that you are uh, imagine that you are a single cell, and what you are able to you you, you like like any good uh, successful agent, you have is some ability to pursue goals. What that looks like is you're a, you're a simple homeostatic agent. Basically, let's say the only thing you care about is uh, pH, local pH, right? So if the pH is too low, you add some acid. If the pH is too high, you add some. Uh, some base and so and the, that kind of thing, right? You're you're basically you've got a little loop, and the way the little loops work is you you take a measurement, 
and you uh, and, and then you compare it to some sort of memory of a set point that you have a very simple memory and then you either you, you act on it and, and so on. Right. So so you're that level. So now so now let's ask, OK, for that for that individual, we can we can draw what I call the, the cognitive um, uh, the cognitive light cone, which is basically the spatial temporal scale of things that it cares about. And it's quite small. It's local. It's uh, maybe it has a little bit of prediction going forward. Maybe it's got some memory going backwards, but it's pretty small. OK. So now imagine that, uh, and so now I'm going to tell you the story of scaling. So now imagine that there are two cells, and these and and these two cells, uh, they can they can communicate. Uh, the standard way of communication is that one sends a signal at some diffusible molecule. It sort of floats along, and the other the other cell catches it. That level of communication makes it really simple for both cells to uh, to know that that signal is coming from the outside. Because it comes from the outside, you catch it on your membrane, and then you have choices. You can either you can either respond to it, you can ignore it, you can believe it, you can disbelieve it, you know, whatever. It's very clear that these are two different individuals talking to each other. Now, evolution figured out a really cool trick to do something different. That cool trick, and I'm sure there are others like it, but but this is the one that we know. Uh, it involves something called gap junctions. Gap junctions are these little um, uh, uh, basically think of a think of like a, of a of a submarine hatch in the surface of the cell. It's a little it's a little circular thing that can be opened or closed, and two of these submarine hatches from adjacent cells can dock together. And cells, most of the cells in your body have these, and then they can be opened or closed. So now the cool thing about that is that uh, if those if they're open, material small small signaling molecules can go from one directly into the internal milieu of the other. So now couple of interesting things happen when 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 you have that kind of uh, that kind of connection. The first thing that happens is be- information uh, inside the cell doesn't have any metadata on it in terms of where it came from. So imagine that the, imagine there are two cells, A and B, and they're connected like this with this gap junction. Cell A gets poked by something, it gets injured or something like that. There's a calcium flux, and this calcium flux and then some second messenger stuff serves as a memory, uh, even if it's short lived, but it serves as a uh, as a as a memory of an event that happened, it's an engram basically. But now this cell is connected to the neighboring cell. That calcium or whatever the physiological state is propagates to the neighboring cell. As soon as it propagates to the neighboring cell, that neighboring cell has this this engram of of damage, which, as far as the second cell is concerned, it's a false memory because the second cell didn't have any mem- any any damage. However, it can't tell because its calcium signal is exactly the same as the one it just got. They're basically Right, it, it can't tell that this is a false memory in some sense. So what happens is by sharing by sharing this kind of information directly into the internal milieu, what happens is you start to erode the boundary between the two individuals. If your memories are partially my memories, it becomes very difficult for us to keep interpersonal identity. It becomes very difficult for us to keep boundaries because because we're sharing now, we're sharing memories. So several things happen when you do this. The first thing that happens is we share memories and we're now uh, kind of in a mind meld, uh, you know, so to speak. That's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is because we're physiologically connected, it becomes impossible for us not to cooperate in the game theory sense of the word, because because anything anything uh, nasty that I do to you comes back immediately. We're connected physiologically, so there is there's no way even even if I could muster the uh, the computational um, um, uh, 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 effort that it would take to say that. To distinguish us, right? We're sharing most of our memories, so so that's not an easy trick. But even if I could, if I could somehow um, muster the computation that I'm going to do this, and I know it, you know it's no good for you, but but I'm going to do it because I'm selfish. That 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 doesn't that doesn't work because we're connected. Whatever happens to you, can it happens to me immediately, right? So 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 the, so these are the things that, that that happen. So so we start. So as far as the right, as far as the second cell is concerned. That's a false memory. As far as the new group individual is concerned, it's absolutely a veridical memory because that individual did, in fact, experience this. The same way that a rat, think about what happens when you train a rat to receive a reward for pressing some sort of button. Only a few cells of the rat interact with a button, the cells on the pause, and only a few cells in the in lower intestine uh, in the stomach lining of the, fro- of the rat get the reward. But so 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 as a collective individual, you don't every cell doesn't have to be part of the experience in order for you to have an experience and have a link, you know, a linkage between two experiences and all that kind of stuff. So so that so those are some things that happen. The other thing that so so you get cooperation, you get a mind meld. The other thing that happens is let's go back to this idea that each cell is a is a homeostatic agent. When you are connected by gap junctions and and you are taking a measurement of, let's say, local pH. 
when you are connected, you're no longer taking a local measurement. You're taking a measurement across the whole thing. And if you're not two cells, you're 100 cells, you're taking a huge measurement because everybody's kind of connected and everybody contributes to the value of that measurement. Because you, you, every cell can't really keep its own independent idea of what's going on. It's, so now it starts to take measurements as a collective. Then you have to compare it to the memory. Well, what memory? You're all sharing a memory. And by the way, it's now much bigger. So you have more computational capacity. So maybe whereas before all you could remember was a single scalar, like what's, my, what's the right pH level? Maybe now you can remember things like, hey, you know, a, a proper limb has to have five fingers. Right? You can remember bigger things because you have bigger computational capacity. You're a network, you're a much bigger network now than you were before. And thirdly, when you act, instead of very local, tiny little actions in that uh, cognitive light cone of a single cell, when the whole collective acts, you can do things like, well, let's all bend in a cell sheet and, and have some kind of um, you know, a, a, a biomechanical uh, topology change and we'll make, a, we'll make a cylinder or something because you're no longer acting as a single cell. You are all connected. You can now take larger actions. So look at what's happened. Everything has scaled up, right? The, 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 the types of things you can measure has scaled up. The types of memories you can have has scaled up. The cooperativity and the ability to work towards these huge goals has, has scaled up. Uh, and, and the ability to take action towards those goals has. And, and in fact, you've now switched spaces, whereas before you were only acting in physiological space. Now, when you're a sheet of cells doing doing large scale tissue level things, you are now acting in uh, more morphous space, right? The, sheet, the, 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 the space of all possible geometric deformations of that sheet. So you've now been act, able to access a new problem space by virtue of scaling up. There's one final thing that happens, and that is uh, the scaling of stress. So if let's let's define stress like this, we're going to we're going to say that stress is the uh, the 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 physical consequences of the delta, the error between the set point and the homeos of, of the homeostasis and whatever's going on now. So if you would like things to be like this, but they're actually like this, that delta, whatever that dis the difference is, that's the stress level. And there's and there's one more important component. So. A single cell will, like any homeostat, will work towards reducing that stress level. That's that's what drives you know all of life, I guess. To 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 try to keep in homeostasis is is by reducing that stress. By one of the things that cells that are connected can do is they can export those stress molecules to their neighbors. So let's say that your stress now how do, how do you keep stress? Well, there are, there are, there are intracell there are. And cytoplasmic molecules that are that are measurement that are ways we can measure stress response, right? Like heat, heat shock proteins and things like that. And to the extent that you can propagate those stress molecules to your neighbors, something very interesting happens. Uh, imagine that I'm a cell. I'm sitting in this whole group of cells. I'm really unhappy because I know that I need to be up there. I need to be closer to the head or the eye, you know, whatever is up there. But these cells are pretty happy. They're not letting me through. Okay. And this is just an example in 3D space. This actually works in any in any kind of space. I'm all stressed. I'm all stressed out because my delta, my error is really high. But what I can do is I can start leaking that 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 stress state into my neighbors. Now, now they're getting stressed out, not because there's anything wrong with them, but they can't tell the difference. They're stressed out because they're getting a bunch of my stress molecules. What that does, what stress does is it raises plasticity. Everybody's a little more willing to make changes, right? If you're super happy, you're making no changes because everything's great. As soon as you're all stressed out, you're starting to, uh, you're getting a little more plastic. And this has been studied in cancer and other, other examples where stress raises plasticity. When, you, when, when you're more plastic and you're willing to sort of move around, and it's almost like raising a temperature in a, you know, in a, in a, in a chunk of metal, all the, all the domains are a little more ready to, to kind of uh, shift. And then now there's room for me to get where I'm going. And then, and then the stress of the whole thing can, can come back down. Look at, look at what that's, that does two things. First, it, it raises cooperativity like crazy because my stress, be, my problem becomes your problem. Not because we're altruistic, not because you care about what my issues are, but because until I get, until my stress lowers, your stress can't lower. So it's an automatic process. It's really, it doesn't require, you don't have to evolve this really. It's, it's, a, it's a free lunch kind of thing. That just means as, as soon as I'm able to propagate my error and not just keep it to myself, we, we, we start to share problems. It means that there's a collective goal now to reduce stress because, uh, because of whatever, whatever my problem happens to be, right? You don't have to care about my problem. You, you can't help it because, because I'm stressing you out. And so, right? And, and the other thing that happens is because of that, much like the previous uh, story, you start to... the. the the state of affairs that can stress you out can now be huge because because the stress is shared then then it's not just individual cell states that that can stress you for example the difference between 
a, a gradient across the whole thing that might that might stress the collective now whereas before no individual cell cares about what the gradient is up there it, they they do once they start sharing the stress so now i i'll end this whole thing just by saying that um if i'm if i encounter a new creature and that could be anything from from a from a bacteria to a super intelligent uh, you know alien uh if you tell me what kinds of things stress you out I immediately know your level of intellectual sophistication. If you tell me that the biggest thing that you can be stressed about is the lo local level of sucrose, you're kind of a bacterium. If you tell me that you're stressed about things that happen in a in a 50 foot radius around a particular perimeter, you might be a dog or you might be something similar. If you tell me that you're stressed about the financial markets uh, in the next 10 years, I'm going to say you're probably a human, right? Nothing below is ever going to be stressed by that level of effect. And if you tell me that you are stressed out in a linear range by the the state of suffering of all life forms on the planet i'm going to say you're you can't you're not a human humans can't do that in a linear range you are some sort of alien some sort of buddha i don't know what you are but you're but you're beyond you're beyond human so right so so to me right to me the level of the 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 biggest thing that could possibly stress you out is a great indicator of of your cognitive level interesting Again, this is and this is all on the the, the spectrums, as you say, of of, of judges. Exactly. This isn't like a a hard line between one or the yep. other. You're you're looking at at spheres of influence and spheres of yep. stress. Yeah, I don't know how to put hard lines on any of this because because if we take developmental biology and evolution seriously, we never see any uh, any real um, uh, uh, we never see any hard lines. All you see is a slow change. So so you were. Uh, an egg, a fertilized egg that at best cared about uh, local physiological conditions and some metabolic conditions. And eventually you might become somebody that's depressed by the thought of the sun burning out in 4 billion years. That's a, that's a massive, right? That's a, that's a massive scale up of your, of your cognitive, uh, uh, you know, light cone, but it happens slow. There was never like, you know, a, a major transition really there. So it, I don't know how to put lines on any of this. It's a gradual process. Hmm. And so from that viewpoint, you would probably say that um, consciousness is also a, on a spectrum with different animals and humans and things like that. There, there's no sharp dividing line between people, say, and other animals. What would you say to that? I, I don't, it, this, this is going to sound, sound silly, but I mean it, I, I, I mean it uh, seriously, 100%. I don't know what you mean by people in the following sense. Whatever, and, and, and people say this to me all the time, you know, well, the human brain does this. And I say, well, let's, let's unpack that, the human brain. Um, and they say, you know, the child, uh, when I ask for, you know, when does such and such happen? They say, oh, it's when the child, whatever. I say, okay, a, a, human, a human brain or a human child uh, now, yes, definitely, you know, definitely a cognitive, deserving of rights, all this kind of stuff, about 100,000 years ago. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely still. About 300,000 years ago, about 400,000 years ago. I mean, if, if we take evolution seriously, you can just start walking backwards. And are you, are you, is, is anybody really telling us that they're going to say this, this set of hominids right here, I'm watching them. They are not really conscious. They are not really whatever. Boom. Now they've had a child and that offspring, that, that creature they've had now it's got whatever. That seems crazy to me, right? That I just that, that that does that's a very strong claim that somebody would have to defend. I have no idea how you defend that claim. All I see is smoothly working backwards, you know, developmental event by developmental event, all the way back back down to bacteria. So so that's how when when I talk to people about this, I don't start with uh, paramecium and ask them to uh, uh, come with me to the idea that the paramecium has some level of first person perspective. Nobody likes that. I do it the other way around. I say start with whatever you are and let's just work backwards and you can tell me when you think it winks out and no one has a convincing story of when it winks out that's the problem you sort of start backwards now some people are you know intellectually i, I suppose the most honest thing is some people will say oh i don't have it either and then and then we're kind of done at that point at that point we're kind of done i don't have anything to say after that but uh, but but as, but as long as you believe that you have whatever it is co you know true cognition true you know moral standing but you pick you pick whatever it is I'm just going to slowly dial it backwards until we end up at an amoeba and you can try to tell me where it, where it disappears. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very, very strong um, argument for, for not distinguishing. I, I do like that, that approach.
Yeah, not only that, and, and Darwin Darwin saw that very clearly. I mean, people people sort of w- w- forgot he he talked a lot about um, basal cognition and 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 intelligence and plants and things like that. He was he he understood the, the consequences very well of of his uh, gradualist theory. There, there's another there's another piece. There's another reason why I'm not sure what anybody means when they say the human, you know, the 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 the, the, the person or the human. We now have the ability, and we've had this for quite some time, and it's going to grow in in magnitude uh, massively to modify. Uh, your standard uh, kind of uh, inborn um, inborn uh, hardware with with modification with with different kinds of add-ons. So so the simple ones are glasses and crutches and and things like that. Those are you know wheelchairs. Those are simple. Um, you know the the new ones are uh, novel uh, prosthetics uh, that that let you do things that standard humans can't do. Novel sensory inputs that might let you see and feel things. You know you might. You might decide that you need some sort of um, implant that lets you see in the infrared and ultraviolet range, or you might decide that, forget that, what I want is I want immediate input from the stock markets and from the solar weather. That's what I, that's what I want my sensory milieu to be. Why not? You could do that. And so, and so then, then we're going to find out that, yeah, you could also have um, an implant that uh, helps control your neurotransmitter levels way better than standard humans do. And by the way, you can also connect up to... Um, uh, some kind of uh, additional processing, whether that be digital or whether that be an implant. You know, let's put a third uh, third hemisphere up in there. Uh, we we know that we. I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, but we know that if if somebody is is blind, real estate in the brain gets taken over by other senses, right? So so we know that that we know that new real estate that doesn't seem to be doing anything gets taken over by various functions. Well, who's to say we can't put additional real estate and then let that get taken over? So all of this kind of stuff, again, it's all very, very gradual. So if you tell me that person X is still a human because they're only 2% cyborg, they have some kind of little implant that lets them run their wheelchair or, or a vacuum cleaner or something, I will then ask you about every possibility from 2% all the way up until you become basically a cyborg with a few human cells rattling around. And then again, you can tell me where you think things wink out. I, I didn't make up any of this stuff. This is science fiction has been dealing with this for, for you know, probably a couple of hundred years now. But, but nobody really took it seriously. And it's, and it's high time because this is all real reality. This is all happening now. It's all, you know, we're going to see all this in our lifetime. Uh, it, we, we are already seeing some of it. So again, it's going to be very, very weird. Look, th- I think, and this is, this is also an unpopular view, but I think that this binary kind of categorization, there are humans and then there are other things. And that's left over from the Garden of Eden view where there was Adam and he got to name all the animals and nothing ever changed. And we knew what what he was and we knew what all the animals were. And like, that's it. That's that's gone. That's gone for so many reasons. It was gone with Darwin. It's gone with developmental biology. It's gone with bioengineering. That's just gone. Very interesting. I want to um, touch on another area of your of your research um in memory i mean one of the key aspects of of awareness is our access to our memories and you've done a lot of work in in the cellular basis of memory i think um do we understand how our memories are stored I, you you've referenced calcium from uh you know individual cell responses is is a is a type of memory do we have any idea how our memories are stored well, uh, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, we have we have some idea of the things that are important for the process. So there are many, many people who are doing great work in memory, and they and they will, they know some of the things that are important for that process. Do I think that we understand the medium and the encoding? No, I don't think we do. And that's you know the 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 story that has held together for some decades of. Uh, uh, memory being uh, uh, specific changes in synapt- you know, synaptic uh, function, that story was already cracking in the in the seventies, and it's really cracking now. And there are some great people um, I can I can mention later later on some some names that you might want to also talk to. There's some great people working on this, um, but uh, that 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 story is really cracking, and there are, there are numerous numerous reasons for it. Here, here are some. If we want to talk about memory, here's some here's some facts we should, you know, just just facts we should think about, and they and they can kind of tell us what uh, what we should be looking for. Number one, um, if you uh, well, the mo- the most basic issue is this: w- most of us in our old age rem- have some some memories of things we did when we were kids. So therefore, there is some kind of structure in your brain 
that is supposed to remain invariant for 80 years, I, I don't know what that would be. I mean, everything we know about is incredibly, incredibly plastic uh, at, the, at the, you know, at the micro scale. I don't know of any kind of structure that plausibly remains invariant for that long. Uh, if you train a caterpillar on a certain task, that caterpillar will will become a butterfly or a moth during that process. It basically takes apart its brain. Most of the neurons die. Most of the connections are broken. It rebuilds a completely new brain. The caterpillar still remembers, the, the butterfly still remembers things that the caterpillar learned. So memory is in some sense uh, robust to massive changes of brain structure. By the way, if you're interested in um, questions of, uh, of first person perspective and, and, and kind of uh, consciousness and philosophy of mind, Think about what it's like, never mind what it's like to be a caterpillar. What is it like to be a caterpillar slowly changing into a butterfly? I mean, how's that? You have, uh, right? You have, you have an adult, you have, you, have a, you have a mature organism that has whatever it has uh, in terms of its cognition. And then that brain starts slowly changing into a brain that has completely different preferences. It doesn't want to crawl anymore. It likes to fly. And now it likes nectar instead of leaves. Yeah. But it still has some of the same individuality because it remembers the original information. But I mean, talk it, it, that, that, that kind of change makes, you know, the changes of puberty in humans or whatever makes that like a child's play, right? Because we all go through changes. But I mean, this is some serious change, right? The entire body plan just gets mixed around in a... In the a body suit. plan is... That's right. The body plan is mixed around. You're going to be... You're going to end up in a completely different creature. You're going to be reborn, literally reborn as but a... memories uh, are, are, are conserved. At least some, at least some. I don't know that all of them are, but some, some of them certainly are. Yeah, and uh, and and there's another, there's another example which is perhaps even even more remarkable. And this uh, McConnell, J Jim McConnell, found this in the '60s, and you know he sort of caught a lot of crap for it, but we we reproduced it with modern uh, methods in 2013, and he was absolutely right. Yeah, they got, they have these uh, flatworms called planaria, and the cool thing, well, well, one of many cool things about these planaria is that they regenerate every part of the body. So you can cut off their heads, they grow, the, the tail will grow a new head. But they have a true centralized brain. They're bilaterians like us. So they, they uh, you know, they have a true centralized brain. So you can, so, so you can train these planaria, you cut off their heads, you take the tail, the tail will sit there for a week doing absolutely nothing. Then it regrows a brand new brain. Then you find out that the new animal has, uh, has, uh, has still has the memories. So now what that tells you is, first of all, memory is not entirely in the brain. That's A. B, it gets imprinted onto the new brain but because, because the brain controls behavior. So in order for you to see that it remembers, the brain had to have learned whatever it was. So that, so that, that is imprinted by, um, uh, it's, it's imprinted on the, on the brain by, by other cells. And, this, and by the way, you could have cut that worm into multiple pieces. They will all have the memory. So this is like the old uh, uh, malfunctioning transporter experiment in philosophy 101, right? When there's more than one copy of you. But you can actually do that. Planaria can actually do that. And, uh, and, and then, of course, you know, of course, this is not just a, a, a weird curiosity. Humans undergoing in, in, the, in the next decade, we're going to have, uh, a, you know, adult humans with five, six decades of memory and personality uh, have stem cells put into their brains to, uh, to, to repair degenerative brain disease. So what happens when portions of your brain become replaced by these naive cells? I, I have a, based on this, I have a feeling that it'll be just fine, but it may, it might not be. So, so, right. So this issue of how do memories move around in the, in, in tissue. So, so I think, uh, you know, all in all, so, so I don't, so I think we don't know. There are some people that have done some, you know, um, uh, Glantzman has done some 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 amazing work uh, recently, and and other people have on on uh, transplanting memories. So so you can transplant uh, mem you can transplant both tissues and chemicals from brain to brain, and there's there's some evidence for for transplanting memories. Uh, I I will wow. I, I will I will uh, no nobody's done this in people that I know of. No, this has been this has been in animal models. Yeah, they, they've done rats. I mean, there was a lot of work in the '70s on on doing this in rats. Uh, I, I will say, I'll just go on the record here with a crazy, you know, sort of idea. I think that the neural network, in, the neural networks in our, in our brain and in our central nervous system are not for storing information. I think they're for interpreting information. So I think there is some kind of medium. I don't know what it is. It might be cytoskeletal structures. It might be biochemical structures. I don't know what it is. But I think the neural networks are all about reading that substrate. They're, they're the... Uh, they're the readout machinery, you know. They're the they're the electronics that read the the, the hard drive, so to speak. And the hard drive is probably uh, in some way it's it's very stable. It's probably uh, biophysical in some sense, and it can be transferred and transplanted. And all the neur neural networks are are about interpreting it. 
to know to know what to do next. That's just that's just you know that's a that's a wild speculation. Yeah. No, it makes sense. I mean, it, it looks like a processor, and and people have used neural networks in artificial intelligence to do processing type things, and the, the things that neural networks, artificial neural networks, do are processing based. They're not necessarily memory based. You have a hard disk somewhere with the memories, and you have the processor that ac accesses them, and so yeah. we don't really know where this hard disk lies, but it's not necessarily in the brain based on these experiments. It's it's yeah. maybe some sort of distributed chemical system in the body. It 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 may it may well be, and again, it's unclear how much of this transplants uh, uh, tr transfers rather. So I made a I made a kind of a, a Freudian slip there because of the next thing I was going to talk about. Uh, it uh, how much of this transfers from uh, from from planarian? People have done transplants in. Um, uh, salamander. Um, so there's a guy named Paul Peach at Indiana who uh, transplanted memories between goldfish and and salamanders and did a lot of uh, did a lot of. If if you if you ever come across it, there's a cool book called Shuffle Brain by Peach, and it's all about his experiments on shuffling the brains of uh, of various uh, aquatic uh, creatures. Uh, it's very good. Um, but you know, there's also been there's also been, and I, I have no idea how how seriously to take any of this. Because there's there haven't been real sort of rigorous studies on it, but but I've spoken to a lot of um, folks who work in uh, organ transplants, and there is some data starting to come out from, especially from heart and lung transplants, that there are interesting what what look like reasonably specific transfers of information from donor to recipient from lung. Uh, so personality changes. We're talking wild stuff like. Uh, you know, changes in political orientation, ch changes in sexual preference, like food, you know, ve vegetarians uh, going immediate, that like that kind of stuff. Um, there'll have to be a lot more studies before we know how seriously to take this. But it's it's something that uh, is, is widely sort of talked about in the transplant community. So at some point, wow. we might find out it, at some point, we might find out that it's human relevant. I, I don't know. I'm not making that claim. I, I certainly haven't done any of the work. I, I, but, but I think it's a, there's enough there that somebody should be doing rat experiments with, with transplants and to figure out if, if there's something to that. But I, I would not be shocked at all if that turns out to be real. I think, I think that's completely plausible based on what we've seen in, in planaria and other, other creatures. And is there any reasonable hypotheses to 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 explain why this could happen? Not, not really. No, honestly, no. There's no. There's not. Uh, <laughs> no. Other, other than other than the general idea that that uh, the memory medium is n not really what we think it is, and maybe broadly distributed through through tissue in some way. Uh, but but no, this is just at this point uh, it's complete. It's total guesswork as far as what if if that's real, what the what the uh, me mechanism is not known. Oh, wow, that's great. I love I love mysteries. <laughs> So what, what from your research, um, have you found that, that, that you, you find really surprising? I mean, th these are very surprising results to me to, just to learn some of these, you know, that transplants of memories might be possible. And, and this is a serious idea that has experimental support. Uh, is there anything else that, that surprises you or that you find very intriguing that you'd like to share? Um, well, let's see. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, there are many things that are very intriguing. I see surprising things, uh, on, a, on a daily basis, uh, in our work and in other people's work. I mean, I think one of the things that is, is really intriguing is how much new science and new experiments you can do if, if you're willing to look for new symmetries. So, so, so what I mean by that is, for example, if we, if we accept that, uh, provisionally, that all the tricks of the brain and 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 what happens during a, a kind of typical cognition are really uh, evolutionary modifications of much earlier bioelectric kinds of uh, events that cells were using before to navigate morphous space, and then it sort of got pivoted into navigating three dimensional space. Then one can read almost any uh, paper in neuroscience as a developmental biology paper. What you do is, and I've had we, we you know we've we've done this experiment. Uh, with my students, where you take a you take a neuroscience paper and you put it through Microsoft Word and you do a find replace, and anywhere it says neuron, you do, you replace that with cell. Anywhere it says mill millisecond, you say minute or hour, and then you just read it as a developmental biology uh, kind of uh, kind of paper. And it's and it's amazing how many of those concepts have obvious testable predictions that that we are checking and that other people should be checking. So all the all the kinds of 
you know, mm -hmm. neuroscience is incredibly rich and I don't think it's about neurons. I think, I think all of the things that we see in neurons from, from dissociative identity disorder to various uh, kinds of uh, psychiatric, uh, you know, um, uh, problems to uh, various aspects of, you know, perceptual bistability, all this kind of stuff that you get from, 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 from cognitive neuroscience and these kinds of things, they all have somatic analogs. They all have uh, uh, analogs that, that, that work in other contexts including cellular kinds of things and, and maybe subcellular too. And, and, and actually maybe even supercellular, you know, that, um, uh, people have shown that ant, uh, ant colonies, uh, fall for the same visual illusions that humans do, not the individual ants, the colonies. So you can lay out food sources in a particular pattern and you will see that the way that the colony sends out ants to sort of collect and come back and whatever, they, they make exactly the same mistakes as human perceptual systems make when in the, in the light of this, in the, in these illusions. So it's like not the individual ants, but the, but the, but the group cognition of the colony is subject to some of the same, uh, uh, you know, limitations of, processing uh, mistakes. yeah, this, exactly right. Exactly the same processing mistakes as humans. Super interesting. And of course that happens on a cellular level as well, maybe on a, on a group level. So that to me is one of the most profound things that I find intriguing is the scale and variance of a lot of these things. Um, and uh, how you can find some of the same, the, you know, you can find some of the same phenomena at, at, at multiple scales, I think is, is incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. So you're, you've, you're very um, empirical in your approach, as, as you've said, and, you know, you, you don't consider the, the hard problem of consciousness much in this research. And, and that, that comes through in your description of these things. So I, I think um, there are various schools of thought about the, the so-called hard problem of consciousness. And some people say, well, sure. artificial intelligence will never be conscious because blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. But if you look at it on, on the, the mechanistic scale of small steps there, as you say there, when does the soul suddenly appear? <laughs> yeah, that's the, pro that's the problem, right? Is, is you're, you're left with these sort of medieval, uh, in, irresolvable questions about, you know, what day is it that the, that the soul shows up? I, it, it's, they're unsolvable. And, and I think that, um, and look, I, it's, it's not that I don't worry about the, pro the, the problems of consciousness. I absolutely do. I just try to keep it very, very separate from all the other work because, well, for two reasons. One is because I think you can do all this other work without you know, I, I, I like divide and conquer, right? So if we can solve a bunch of stuff without having to solve the hard problem, that'd be great because we should, we should solve things we can solve. So I try to keep it separate. I also try to keep it separate because, because just in terms of making impact, once you start talking about consciousness, some people write you off immediately because they don't want to get into it. Other people uh, make it way over complicated with, with things that again, make it hard to make progress. I, I just try to keep it separate, but, but, um, there, uh, but, but there are some things we can say about, about this, a couple of things. First of all, this idea of such and such will never be conscious. I, it, with, the, with the exception of the few is sort of intellectually honest, but, but people who say, well, we are not conscious either. There's no such thing, right? So there's a few people that say that. But, but, but the majority of the people who say, no, I'm a real human and I'm conscious and such and such will never be conscious. My, my, in it, I, I have two things to say about that. One is the whole gradual developmental thing. Okay, you you were definitely a, a, a cell at one point, so we can all talk about how you got to be conscious. But uh, it was a nice slow process. That's that's the first thing. That, that's really important. It was a gradual process. That's a B. B. I really don't see why. I mean, where where did we and our consciousness come from? Now now that we don't have the Garden of Eden story anymore, you're left with just one thing, and that's evolution. So, so what you're really telling me is that this, this nearly blind uh, sort of um, meandering hill climbing search that we call evolution, which is just as likely to increase intelligence as it is to decrease it. You're telling me that that mm -hmm. process is the only process that can give rise to conscious minds and that no amount of engineering will ever duplicate whatever it is that this natural blind process is doing. I find that completely implausible. If somebody said to me, hey, what's more likely, if I didn't know any better, and somebody said to me, what's more likely to produce consciousness, a, a random search or some very smart scientists who will, who, by the way, can also use random search if they want to, but they can also have, you know, a rational design. I would say, well, of course, the second one. Well, why, why would you ever think that that evolution has some sort of magic uh, hold on being able to make conscious agents? So that seems completely implausible to me. So, so I don't see any reason to think that 
we could talk about what's you know what the today's artifacts are doing, but but to say that they can't it seems it seems crazy to me. Yeah, I think some of the the objections that are maybe more um, believable um, would be the ones that are saying you know you can't use a digital processor to do the same processes that the analog stuff in in cells and and bodies is doing and that there need to be some sort of a field happening or an effect of fields and um yeah i don't know how much credence to give that i don't know i've I've heard about that i I think it's a hard claim to to really defend but also that in no way uh supports the idea of they will never be conscious right because because it could well be that tomorrow somebody says oh yeah uh, I think you're right. And from now on, I'm going to make my computers as analog uh, computers with fields and whatever. Why not? I, right? Uh, who, who knows what the next architecture is going to be? It, it, it's fine to say that today's, I mean, I, I agree that today's architectures are not likely to give us what we consider to be the full, you know, sort of conscious experience. I agree with that. But but I don't think we're we're that far from architectures that will. And I certainly don't think it's possible to say we will never do it. Um, I, I, one other one other thing that I that I just want to point out uh, this idea of uh, I, 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 as, as I said, I kind of hate um, binary distinctions for almost anything. And so at one point I was sitting around thinking about, OK, what is the most uh, what is the most mo- like the strongest binary distinction that 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 we couldn't turn into a continuum? Right. Like what's the what's really the most the most uh, persistent binary thing? And and the thing that came to my mind was well first person versus third person descriptions. So so from the third person perspective, no, there's no hard problem of consciousness because they're all bo- in the third person. It all boils down to behavior. I have no idea what if any consciousness you have. All I can do is make guesses based on your behavior. However, from the first person perspective, there absolutely is uh, a, an interesting uh, hard problem of consciousness because. I know some things, not a lot, but I know some things about my own behavior. But I also have this first person experience that is is telling me that that I don't have any science that that predicts what that experience is going to be. That's a problem. So that's the hard problem of consciousness. Um, so, I've, so I have two things. So I have two things about two things to say about that. One is that. Uh, Let's assume for the moment that that some in some number of years somebody has a cor- a, a correct theory of consciousness. Let's say somebody's got one. Okay, my question is is very simple. Never mind what it actually does. I want to know what format do its predictions come in. We know from from every other theory, we know what format the predictions come in. They're either numbers or they're shapes or there's some there's something. What is the format of a prediction of a theory of consciousness? What does it give you? So if I tell you, hey, guess what? I've made a frog a lot. It's a 50% frog brain, 50% axolotl brain. I want your correct theory of consciousness tell me to tell me what it's like to be a frog a lot, right? What do you hand me with you? What like what comes out? Is it is it a it's not gonna be numbers? That doesn't help explain, you know. Is it gonna be a poem? Is it gonna be art? Like what is it going to <laughs> oh, I, I have no idea what it's going to be. And so this is a yeah, this is yeah. this to me is the hard problem of consciousness, right? Not not what is the details of the theory. I don't even know. And so, okay, so so start. So I started thinking about that, and I started to think about uh, this uh, this 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 idea of breaking breaking that bi- that that binary divide, which seems pretty sharp. I mean, like Descartes said, it seems pretty pretty pronounced. And and I and I and I came up with this thought experiment, let's, which is pretty re- pretty uh, doable even today. So let's let's think about this. Um, so here I am. I'm studying uh, uh, somebody's brain. Let's say I'm studying your brain, and. Uh, and what I've got is I've got some some electrodes in your brain. I'm collecting some data. They come through a computer. They're processed. I'm looking at them on the screen, and I, I they, they're saying something about we're doing some neural decoding, let's say. And so I can say something about what what's going on in your mind right now. Some something about what memories you have or something. Now at that point, that's a completely third person perspective. I don't know what conscious experience goes along with any of what I'm seeing. What I see is things I could predict behavior on. But I don't really know anything about what it's like to be whatever it is that that you are. So that's the first thing. Then I then I look at it and say, you know, this computer in the middle is super clunky. Why am I using my retina to look at a screen to interpret electrical data that's coming out? The hell with that. Let's just do this. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the electrodes that are coming out of your brain, and I'm going to directly stick them into a relevant part of my brain so we can get this computer out of the way, and I'm going to feel the data. The same way that I could feel, for example, 
uh, if I wanted to, I could take, um, you know, I could take data from, uh, from, the, from the, uh, the, the, the collider, right? The large Hadron Collider. I could take that data and I could put it into a glove or, or an artificial retina. I could feel that data directly the way I see light photons, right? Why not? So, so at this point, I'm going to get rid of this computer and I'm just going to say, to heck with all this stuff. I'm just going to direct. So now your brain and my brain are linked. Now, I think you can already see where this is going. To some extent, if we do the linkage correctly, uh, I'm going to start to actually, I'm, I'm no longer quite a third person. I'm at like, 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 like one, like, like one and a half person perspective now, because, because, because how do I normally know how I feel? Well, parts of my brain read other parts of my brain, right? How do I know what my state is? The, the pieces of the brain are communicating. Well, now you're in the same circuit. Why not? And then I say, you know, these, these, this electrical interface is really clunky. It doesn't have the bandwidth of proper cellular connections. Here's what I'm going to do. We're just going to, we're just going to physically uh, uh, attach our brains together. That's totally doable. If we were salamanders, you could literally take the two brains, stick them together. The cells would, would attach and you would have one giant brain and they would all talk to each other. Right now, what, what, what would happen after that? I don't know. But, but here's what happens after that. Once our brains are connected, whatever it is that my brain is doing when the two hemispheres talk to each other, because, because you might be tempted to say, so, so I've run this by people and what people say is, oh, that's a crazy uh, thing. We, we don't know what that connection is going to do to consciousness. It was, well, guess what? You already have that because your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere have to talk to each other. And in fact, the front of your brain and the back of your brain have to talk to each other. So we already know that pieces of brain talking to each other is what's responsible for consciousness. We already know that. So now, well, my brain is just bigger now. It's got two, it's got four, four hemispheres now. But the, the, the basis of it is still exactly the same. Uh, but here's the thing. From that, what I don't find out is what it's like to be you. What I do find out is what it's like to be this new creature that's really me, you. That's what we find. That's what both of us find out. So I don't you think it's become a new self. That's it. We, that's exactly right. We become a new self. And, we, and people say, oh, come on, that's crazy. But, but we know this happens all the time because if we divide the two hemispheres, what do you get? You get two, basically two, two selves because we know from the split brain studies, the two halves have very different uh, outlooks on things, right? You know, these experiments where you, you, you do a split brain, you ask verbally, you say, how do you like your job? Well, I'm an accountant and I like it fine. You let the opposite hand answer questions in writing, and it says, "Screw this! I hate this! I want to be a race car driver." And so, uh, we we already know we already know that that exists. So, if we can, you know, at at what point is there this fusion? And then and then the most interesting thing is all the work on um, uh, uh, dissociative uh, dissociative disorders, right? What used to be called multiple personality disorder. So. We already know the boundaries of these selves are flexible. They're flexible in, in the body in the, of cells. They're flexible in the, in the brain. So, so now we can smoothly, so now there's kind of a smooth continuum between this third person and first person. So even that, I think, is really a continuum because we can construct all of these in-between cases, which are totally plausible, where you slowly go from being an external scientist who can say nothing about the, cognition, the consciousness and only cognition to being, I am now part of this, this system. And I think it's probably not an accident that uh, some ancient thinkers talked about this and they talked about, you know, the difference between um, chemistry and alchemy, right? The difference is that, yeah, you can, do, you can do chemistry as a third person kind of perspective and just sort of study what happens outside of you. To really do experiments on consciousness, you will not be the same afterwards. The only way to do experiments in consciousness is to change your consciousness in some way. Right. And there's a million ways that people <laughs> thought of, yeah. about doing that. Right. So that's what I think, you know, that's that's the difference. But but again, it goes in in gradations. So I do think it's an interesting problem, but it's not the same problem as just studying cognition. Well, that this has been a, a very uh, enlightening discussion and I've really enjoyed chatting with you. Likewise, uh, we're getting to Thanks. the end of our our time slot here. So thank you so much for coming on the show and, and discussing your, your research with us and, and your views on on consciousness and cognition. Um, wow. A lot, lot to think about from this. I'm going to, I'm going to fire off a, a rational view t-shirt to you for, for coming on the show. Nice. Um, thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. And thank you so uh, much. one last question that I ask uh, all of my guests. Um, and I think I, I'd be very interested in your response. What, what science fiction interests you? What do you, what do you like reading? Yeah, um, well, I, th there's a lot. I've read. I've read quite a lot of uh, mostly the older stuff. I think uh, 
the my favorite um, my favorite author is uh, is Stanislav Lem. So he's a Polish he's a Polish writer that uh, I you know uh, he he just plays with all this kind of stuff that we were talking about all these all these unconventional boundaries and things that uh, yeah that's that's probably my that's probably my favorite. I like the science fiction that gives me new ideas. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's the, the thing I, I like so much about about reading uh, new new fiction. So thank thank yep. you again for coming on. Uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, great conversation. Thank you. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page at patron.podbean.com slash The Rational View. Thanks for listening.